Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is, I'm Peter Whittle. Now, for many years, immigration was top of the list of the public's concerns. For a while, it seemed to drop off. Now it's back there at number three, if we are to believe the polls. Of course, for millions of us, it never really left the top position, uh, including me. Uh, during the past couple of decades, uh, Migration Watch, the think tank, is the only organization that has actually argued for properly controlled immigration. It's done it from a very forensic and statistical point of view. So I'm delighted that today my guest is Alp Mehmet, who is chairman of Migration Watch. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Absolute pleasure, Peter. Thank I've you. been looking forward to this moment. Oh. Um, Alp, I'm going to start with a very broad question. Should people trust this government on immigration? They've certainly not provided any uh, serious evidence so far that anyone should trust them, frankly, um, and especially on immigration. At the moment, I certainly don't trust what they're doing on immigration, primarily because they set out to control immigration. That's what we were being told in 2019. We will control immigration along with everything else now that we're out of the EU. When pressed, not only were they going to control immigration, but they were going to reduce it. And both the Prime Minister and indeed the Home Secretary through the campaign said, we will reduce immigration. That has gone out of the window. They've introduced a points-based system, an Australian points-based system, which is very far from being an Australian type of points-based system. There are no limits for a start, and that is central to the overall Australian system. The Home Secretary, speaking recently, said, um, no, uh, reducing numbers, reducing uh, immigration to tens of thousands, that's old speak. We're, we're not going to do that. What we're going to do is bring in the sort of people that we need. And that was it. So for over 10 years, we had uh, a government, a Conservative Party saying to us, we will reduce immigration, we will reduce immigration. Now they're saying, no, no, that's old speak, we're not going to do it. That's why I don't trust them. When you look at the detail of the system that they have introduced, that in fact is going to lead to more immigration, yeah. not less. And the reason for that is the points-based system is supposed to um, allocate, um, award certain number of points for particular areas before one qualifies for, um, qualifies for a visa to come here. What they've done is actually reduced the qualification levels. They've reduced the um, salaries that are to be earned. The, earnings levels have been reduced. There is now no looking locally first. There is now um, no looking to see what need there is for a particular job. In, in really one fell swoop, what they've done is effectively opened up uh, the jobs market to something like 600 million people around the world. So can I trust them on immigration? Well, I've seen nothing yet mm. that would suggest to me that I should be trusting them or anyone should be trusting them. What's the rationale behind what they're doing? Because fr frankly, it flies in the face of everything that people wanted or concerned about. I mean, essentially, as I see it at the moment, uh, and please tell me if I'm wrong, Net migration, this great net figure, is around about 300,000, just under 300,000 a year, isn't it? With these new 
relaxations. What do you think it might be in going into the future? Um, we're in a difficult position at the moment for obvious reasons. Um, international travel all but came to a halt last year. It, it has done since sort of March last year. So uh, it's very difficult to know precisely what is going on. What the government has also done is actually stopped the, that system of surveys at the airport where people would be asked what they were coming here to do and how long they would be here. You may have been um, confronted by people with clipboards asking these questions. All that stopped. So we don't actually know what is really going on at the border. They are looking at sort of official data, you know, be it, um, I don't know, national insurance cards or uh, tax receipts, or there are sort of additional um, data that they, they can uh, um, uh, examine. So they, they have come up, the most recent figure, I think, was a net migration at 247,000. However, it's no good looking at what's been going on over the past 18 months, or even, even since we, um, we came out of the EU, and even before that, the time of the referendum that you had something to do with, I seem to recall. The fact is that um, people started to react in a certain way as a result of the referendum, some people uh, believe that a lot of people left from the EU, but there's no evidence of that, frankly. And if you look at the, uh, the, the, the number of people who registered uh, to uh, th those who have registered for settlement or pre-settlement, this status that they were uh, given an opportunity to, um, to acquire if they wished, we'd been told that there was something like 3.7 million people or thereabouts getting up towards 4 million from the EU who would likely apply for settlement. It turned out to be over 6 million for goodness sake. So the truth is that we're not entirely clear as to what is going on with numbers at the moment. But if you look at the last 20 years, then what has clearly been happening, and I'm sure will continue to happen in the future, whatever is going on at the moment, around 300,000 net have been coming to this country over that period. That is huge, absolutely huge. It has um, effectively doubled the number of non-UK born people in this country in, in 20 years from four and a half million to, to nine million. Nine million now in doubled in 20 years. Yeah. yeah. And, and those who were not born here. If you add children who were born to uh, uh, those new arrivals, then we're now looking at an additional seven million people to our population in 20 years, the bulk of which is the result of migration, direct and indirect. I mean, that, that is phenomenal. It's happened at such a speed. And that is really what has always concerned us at Migration Watch. Not immigration per se. I am an immigrant, as, as you know. It's not, and immigration is, has, has been a contributor not all immigration, some migrants, some groups of migrants contribute quite a bit. Vast majority do not. Time and again, uh, research has shown and studies have shown that those who arrive um, at relatively low skill or unskilled jobs, relatively low amounts of pay, they end up in one way or another actually drawing on the system rather than contributing 
into it. And, and that's really what, what concerns Migration Watch and what has always concerned us. And, and before you know, people say, well, we're scaremongers, well, over the last 20 years, time and again, we have shown, uh, we have projected, forecast, and been lambasted for it at times. And in the end, we've turned out to be absolutely spot on. This 300,000, I remember going back to the early part of this century. They said, you know, we must never let this become the new normal. Uh, I think both of us grew up at a time where roughly it was about 50,000 net. I mean, I'd say up until the mid 90s, roughly 50,000 net. Um, but of course, it has become the new normal. Um, and there's almost no comment about it, apart from people like you. Um, I don't mean in the population, but in the media. Um, it's, I think it's almost barely reported on, actually. Um, but this is of historical proportions, isn't it? This isn't, this isn't just, oh, immigration is quite big for a while at the moment for these reasons. This is a massive movement of people, isn't it? It's, it's unprecedented. Um, firstly, the, the rate at which our population is growing is that is a new phenomenon it really is but in addition to that the scale of immigration we have never experienced anything like it you say it's the new norm well um i'd like to say it's become the norm simply because the government has proved itself totally incapable of doing anything about it and perhaps the reasons why they've now eased off any attempts to reduce immigration is um, is because they can't do anything about it and politically they were continually being um, held up to ridicule because they said they would do something and very obviously failed I don't think it's it's the new norm it shouldn't become the new norm what must happen and it's still not too late really for us to reduce immigration because if we don't I think that the, the single biggest risk is the, uh, um, the, the absence and the difficulty to integrate that is going to lead the sort of the, the underlying uh, um, the, the, the underlying problems, risks, um, tensions that I think potentially can prove very damaging to our society. And it's the sort of thing that um, Dame Louise Casey, who did her own report in 2016, said, you know, we're sleepwalking into an integration crisis, she said. Absolutely right. But there's absolutely no... There's no, there's, it's impossible, surely, and as you say, but also it, it, it's unnecessary uh, to integrate if people are coming in such numbers and they can go straight into a community. I mean, for example, a good, a good example of this would be there was a discussion for a while, which became very mainstream, about the, the, uh, the use of languages on forms and bureaucratic forms. That, um, even Labour, I remember it was Chaka Uman, I think, uh, said basically uh, we should actually encourage English to be used. Now that argument seems to have been entirely lost and has gone away. Uh, nothing has actually changed. Um, and there is therefore not the incentive, surely, or impulse to integrate if you don't need to. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, what is it that people are integrating into? Yeah. Um, and, and that is a problem. And then, just on a, an anecdotal, personal, subjective basis, um, looking at my own sort of history and, and arrival in this country, where I, I spoke no English. Um, it was, I actually arrived in this country, and I know it from my passport, which had a, a French exit stamp in it um, at Calais. It was the 26th of July. 1956. Uh, my father had come
come to this country in 1950, a Windrush generation of migrant. Um, actually, I, I do rather resent that that particular phase of immigration has been hijacked by a group of people who frankly only formed a very small part of, uh, of, of, of the overall migrant numbers. Um, people like my father and from other parts of the um, Commonwealth at the time were the, by far the majority. Where was he coming from? Cyprus. 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 But I, I arrived in 1956. Um, I spent about 18 months, I suppose, learning English sufficiently well or well enough to get through the 11 plus and ended up in a grammar school in the East End of London um, in September 1959. So uh, you know, it was, yeah, I do recall all, all that period of learning the language, of, of fitting into the community, of what it was that we were fitting into, of the way um, schools conducted themselves, what happened from the moment you started at school in the morning until the time you left. I, I remember um, not really understanding what was being said, but certainly assemblies in the morning where there would be a hymn, um, some of them, uh, well, I didn't really understand any of them at the time. It was only later that I began to understand and have my own favourites. But that's how it would start. And there would be morning assembly, a reading from the Bible. There'd be a little homily from the headmaster. Um, someone who just served in the, in the Second World War, as did all our other teachers. There was this sort of unifying um, upbringing, almost. It was a part of it. In addition to that, I remember at the end of the day, there would be a little prayer before we left school, um, thanking the Lord for um, what he had given us and that he would look after us until we returned the next day. At the end of term, there would be a hymn. In the morning, we would have a morning assembly. There are no morning assemblies by and large now, and certainly not the sort of morning assembly that they used to be in, in primary school in, in the 50s. 60s to a certain extent, started to change through the 70s. Um, although my, my children, they were in school in Kent, the 70s and early 80s, and they still enjoyed morning assembly in the way that I had. It, it has gone now. I mean, that, that was the sort of the, the unifying yes, exactly. effect yeah. of, of with children sort of um, bringing them together, having something, a shared experience. And, and that is what is almost impossible now, given the numbers from the variety of different places in the world who have arrived very quickly. What is it that they would get from singing a morning hymn? Some of them um, would not take part anyway for, for religious reasons. However, um, I do sometimes wonder if in our efforts not to offend new arrivals, we forget that the majority um, is still those whose heritage and lineage you know, goes back hundreds of years in this country. Uh, yes, I mean, you talk about uh, not offending. Uh, yes, that's almost a benign uh, way of looking at it, because I think it was Peter Hitchens who said that, you know, back in the 60s, he, as a Marxist, he, they, and he's, he and his friends all supported as much immigration as possible, not because they cared about Im immigrants, but they basically wanted to, well, destroy the idea of 
Britain and, and British nationality and everything. Um, and one can't help feeling that when you're dealing with these people who are very, the, the, what you might call the pro-migration lobby, and you have argued and dealt with them all the time, they are mostly open borders people, aren't they? I mean, the, the BB, what always struck me about Migration Watch is, is that when you're on the BBC or somewhere, they always say, they always tell the, you know, the audience what your position is, i.e. you want sort of properly controlled migration. They never sort of do the same with these other groups who, in fact, if you look at them, tend to be outright open borders. They, they actually don't like any borders. Yeah, absolutely right. I mean, the, the internationalism really was what it's all about, what it was all about, that we were all going to extend hands across the seas. We were all going to be one mass of humanity and we would all uh, kiss and hug and live happily ever after. At least that was the um, the message. That's what they would have you believe. It was actually all about control. And having served in um, Romania, in Eastern Europe, uh, before the fall of the, the Berlin Wall, uh, there was a nonsense then about how um, socialism, internationalism, would unify the world and it would be in the interests of the workers, it will be interests in the interests of the ordinary people. It, it wasn't any, anything of the sort. All the regime wanted to do was control the ordinary people. And that, in a way, when people say to me about uh, really internationalism and accepting everyone as being the same, yeah, I, I, any human being is, is, is a human being and we respect and love each other uh, insofar as we want to be respected and loved. We shouldn't um, and we mustn't uh, run away with the idea that um, the feelings for nationhood, for, for patriotism, that they are old-fashioned um, and they are almost destructive forces that we must rid ourselves of. I think that is hugely dangerous for, for the world, frankly, if that sort of idea uh, gains currency, that we are all the same and we will have one open border, really, in this country and in every other country so that people can go from one place to another at will. That is so dangerous. That's going to prove so harmful. But you're right. That is precisely what some people advocate. When, uh, can I just go back a bit to uh, the previous question? Um, and you were talking about the government being so incompetent, uh, so therefore hard to trust. Um, I think what strikes some people is is it actually a matter of will, political will, in the sense that when you see what the government of this country and indeed around the world has managed to do very easily with the pandemic, they have closed borders. You know, they have put this place, this in place, that in place, this restriction. You know, when there is a will to do something, it can be done, it seems which would tend to suggest to me that there is no will whatsoever to control migration, nor has there ever been in, in, this, in this particular era we're talking about. You're absolutely right. Um, this government has not shown that it has the political will. Unlike, I mean, dare I say, Theresa May actually genuinely uh, wanted to control and reduce immigration. If she didn't succeed, we know she didn't. But I think she, certainly as Home Secretary, she did have the bottle. Um, it proved unsuccessful in the end. At the time, she was probably the only member of the cabinet, frankly, who wanted to do that. The, the majority of people in the camp, cabinet were against her. David Cameron at various times supported her, primarily because he came up with the idea of 
tenth of sa- tens of thousands in the first place. But even he, in the end, I think he was um, cornered by the business community as much as anything. Because the, the business, business community, big, big conglomerates, actually were quite happy with cheap labour and they wanted to continue with that. Boris Johnson has always been an avowed softy on immigration. He's a liberal on immigration. He was keen, and for all I know still is, to declare an amnesty to uh, illegal migrants, those who are here without permission. I think that um, the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, she is certainly keen to um, get a grip of the channel and a lot of attention is being drawn to what's happening, the yes. bill going through with regard to the channel. Uh, my feeling is that uh, the bill that is going through now will have very little impact, even though it's introducing some, some welcome changes. Um, the fact is that in the end, those crossing the channel will continue for so long as the traffickers are able to get them in. If they get get them in and uh, receive a lot of money in return for doing so, why wouldn't they continue, for goodness sake? Yes, I mean, my my problem with the channel uh, uh, issue is that there's been an awful lot of emphasis on this. Um, And of course it is, uh, it should be controlled and it's terrible what's happening there. But in fact, it sort of draws attention away from the sheer scale of what we were just talking about, the, uh, of, of legal migration, actually, you know, of, of net 250, 300,000. To me, this is the main sort of issue. You know, that what's happening down there is, is, is bad, it's got to be dealt with, but what about this massive issue? I mean, we've had the census, haven't we, this year uh, in March. Um, what do you think, oh, what would you expect that the results of that to be? I mean, as an educated guest, when, it, when we see the results, which is like later this year, I believe, or early next year, what are you expecting that to show? Um, well, let me give you an example of um, what we said and how we were uh, um, castigated for saying so in 2002, shortly after the 2001 census, when we said at Migration Watch that um, over the decade, there would be um, immigration at, um, immigration would add something like 2 million people to the population. Uh, in by the, the the time of the 2011 census, um, it turned out to be 2.1 million. I think we uh, made some similar forecasts at other times as well. For example, in 2004, when uh, we were told that Eastern Europe, uh, the new enlarged EU would lead to something like uh, between five and 13,000 people a year coming from Eastern Europe. Uh, that's what the government was being advised and that's what the, the government believed. We said at the time that those forecasts were uh, really pretty much worthless. Um, we suggested something treble, if not four times that. Uh, in the event, it turned out to be something like 78,000 people a year on average. When uh, Romania and Bulgaria were going to join the sort of uh, workforce available to us and uh, we're going to have the freedom to come to this country at will and work in 2014, uh, we suggested that it would end up something like 50,000 a year. No, 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 we were told. Why would the Romanians come here? I, I remember having a debate with the Romanian ambassador. He said, my people won't come here. There's no reason for them to come here. They will go to Spain or, or Germany. They don't need to come here. Well, 
in the event, not only did a lot of Romanians and Bulgarians come from Romania and Bulgaria, but many of those who were in, in Spain and Italy also decided that they would come here. Uh, and, and there are now well over 400,000 getting on for half a million Romanians here. The fact is that we're an attractive country, that uh, immigration, if left unchecked, would just go on and on and on. This has implications and, and impact on, on our society. And it, it has the sort of adverse effect that I think the majority of people in this country, whatever we may hear from the uh, um, Southeast media and the BBC, the fact is that the vast majority of people in this country are concerned immigration. You referred earlier to it now becoming, uh, gaining more salience and uh, more importance in uh, the way that people uh, regard it, are concerned about it. Yes, that is happening and it will continue to develop so that it becomes the single most important issue for many people. We, we, we consistent, consistently find that something like um, 30 million people in this country believe that immigration has been too high and needs to come down. And included in that, I think, that 30 million are people who feel very strongly about it as well, aren't they? Very strongly and, and less strongly, but they basically believe. I mean, I think, you know, many of the things that we discuss on this channel, such as issues like free speech, and all of that sort of thing. Um, I think they are also, strangely enough, a direct consequence of mass migration in the sense that there used to be an argument that if you're going to have this, you're going to have to limit to an extent what people can see about, say about certain groups and that sort of thing, or religions. Um, and so, in fact, it's funny that this has become acute, all of these issues become acute at the end of a period of huge migration. Um, you mentioned the, two, the 2011 census. That was the time uh, which was quite historic in London. We're both Londoners, aren't we? We are. Uh, yeah. uh, where the white British population, I think, was for the first time in a minority of 45%. Um, and probably already have been for a few years then. I mean, what is your, what, what will it be this time? I mean, 10 years is a long time out. Do you, do you, what, what, what would you say the proportion will be? Well, uh, we know from our own research and our own studies that uh, what happened, uh, and, and really looking at sort of figures 2019, 2020, the um, proportion of white British, I mean, that's the category that is um, that shows up in in all the surveys when you list when you go for your jab and you say what's your ethnic background and there's a white british um, category there that particular category has gone from 2001 being 89 percent of the population nationally England. nationally the uk uk to 79% 20, 20 years later. That's a huge drop. That's a huge drop. There's a number of our major cities and towns, not just London, Manchester, Birmingham, Leicester, Luton. I mean, these are Cambridge, I think, where the ethnic minority population is effectively the majority and that includes children born to to migrants yeah. so yeah i mean that that is really what what we have found what our research and studies over the last year or so have found and what it is that certainly concerns me as as someone who uh, really arrived accepted, fitted in, and made their way through, um, through my life and uh, be became a, a part of 
British society. The thing is, is it, this is the whole point. You see, I don't think anyone is actually against immigration. We're not talking about immigration as such. We're talking about mass immigration. And, and, and those, those issues now are, you know, they, they tend to be, um, to be fudged together. I mean, you, you can't be in favor of migration, but not mass migration. Uh, you're either one or the other, which, you know, you, 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 and you're a bigot if you're not, and all of this sort of thing. But, I mean, I know that the Migration Watch does not, you know, you, the last thing you tend to do is speculate, but there are these things going, uh, you know, concerns going around, and you hear these things like, by the middle of this century, like 2060, white British will actually be in a minority. Do you have, does that have credibility for you? Does the fact that the white British will become a minority, in other words, the majority will become a minority yeah. uh, by the end of this century, certainly, when precisely it will happen, we don't know. But, but one thing you can be absolutely certain of, that with migration, net migration continuing at the rate of the last 20 years, it will happen. Whether we like it or not, it will happen. Now, there are those who say, so what? Does it matter? No, it doesn't. The more, the merrier. We're going to have lots of wonderful foreigners in this country who work hard and will look after us in our old age. Well, I'm sorry, but mm, yeah. <laughs> the vast majority of people don't think like that, mm. don't want it to happen and are concerned that we are heading in that direction. The thing is, is the interesting thing about this, you see, is, is that that's a perfectly reasonable position, i.e. to be concerned about that. And it would not be considered to be a weird question, you know, to ask in almost any other country. If you said to India or Japan or, or any country, actually, oh, well, you know, in fact, you know, by the end of this century or at some point in the century, you will actually be a minority. They would have something to say about it. Um, it's somehow that we are not meant to. In fact, if anything, we're meant to celebrate this fact. That, that, that's, you know, we're sort of meant to celebrate as though something bad is being overcome. Well, you're absolutely right. Celebrating diversity almost became the sort of the underlying mantra that we would celebrate it and we would encourage it, in fact. And that's pretty much where... Um, policy is at the moment really that we are it's it's continuing apace it doesn't matter we should we should welcome it we should think very carefully frankly before welcoming it yeah, yeah. and you're absolutely right in any other country and I, i've served in a few countries and i've you I've were a diplomat with, were you not you were you were an ambassador I, I was indeed a diplomat um some say oh you're still too much of a diplomat you you never quite say it the how it should be said um i would argue that i probably in the eyes of some and the ears of some i say uh, rather more than um they would like me to say but that's another issue yeah in any other country that i've worked in with um no one would no one would bat an eyelid if you said, well, wait a minute, there are far too many foreigners coming to this country and they are threatening us. Um, I'm not sure that I would say that, put it in quite those terms, but nevertheless, that's the sort of attitude that you would get. South Africa, uh, they're concerned about the Zimbabweans going there. I, I was listening to uh, from our own correspondent yeah. program. This this was a few years ago now, and I've, I've tried to track it down, but the BBC seems to have um, removed it from its archives. But th there was a, a correspondent talking about Johannesburg. He was from Johannesburg, and he really was um, he was saddened. He was angered by the fact that so many Angolans had moved into neighborhoods that he was familiar with uh, in um, Johannesburg and had ha had changed the character of the neighborhoods. 
And he said, I don't, I don't like it. I don't want it. I, there was a similar program about this country. And there was a, a, an interview of, of someone in, in Wales who was bemoaning the fact that a lot of primarily English had moved into uh, the village for holiday homes and having done so had changed the character of uh, mm -hmm. I, the, Lithuania has brought up barriers from the barbed wire to stop Belarusians from, from entering. In Poland, they're complaining about the number of Ukrainians. So wherever you look, of course, people are concerned, whatever the state of their country is, if they feel that they're being, they're being taken over by outsiders. I was in Nigeria 40 years ago when the Nigerians took again the number of Ghanaians who were in the country illegally and said, right, that's it. By, um, I think it was the 1st of September, any Ghanaian, and Ghanaian here without permission is going to be arrested and imprisoned or deported uh, unless they can show that they've got permission to be here. A million Ghanaians <laughs> really were forced out. And I remember the BBC correspondent who actually became a friend, but I, I won't mention his name. He, um, he, he arrived to cover the story and firstly was um, detained because he had a passport that showed that he'd been to South Africa. And that was taboo in Nigeria in, in the early 80s. And then he got in a cab and made his way to the border to see um, there was sort of lots of footage of hundreds of thousands of Ghanaians making their way, um, being forced to cross the border out of Nigeria. So yes, whichever country you look at, really, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, Asia, there is always concern where uh, the perception is that uh, um, outsiders, foreigners, for that's what they are, um, are, are now increasing in, in such numbers that they, they pose a threat to the locals. Or well, the culture or the unity of the country. Yeah, the culture, that, that I, that's probably the single most important um, issue, really, um, for, for many people. I, I referred earlier to the way the day, school day used to start in, in the 50s and 60s. It doesn't now. Um, this country, yeah, we mustn't forget that it's founded on Judeo-Christian belief, um, values, and that so much of that is reflected in, in our laws, in our institutions. And, and that potentially, as numbers increase and increase at a very rapid rate, it's that sort of um, stabilizing force at the center mm. of what this country is that is potentially threatened. Oh, um, I, I think that's without, uh, without question. Um, I'll, just to, to, to end, uh, you know, big question maybe, but what should happen? I mean, you know, we, we talked about the uselessness of the current system and, and point systems and all of this. Um, no party really is giving any kind of real uh, suggestion or policy. I think the SDP, the new SDP, uh, small party, uh, they think there should be a, what they call a pause uh, on migration for for generation, 20 years, 25 years. Um, that to me seems to be, you know, the most, you know, plausible way actually of, of, of stopping what we don't want to happen. Um, what's your feeling about this? What, what is, what does migration, what say, right, there should be a limit on like 
40,000 people a year, or, or what? Um, I think limits, ceilings, certainly have a place and, and they have a role uh, within our overall system. The Australians do it. They decide that their economy, their needs, say, so much per year, and that's reviewed, as I understand it, every year, and they decide what the limit is going to be. I think we should certainly seriously look at that. Um, stopping immigration, saying, right, no more immigration for the next three years, five years. Actually, the French yeah. are beginning to look in that direction. And Michel Barnier, there he was telling us, no, 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 you've got to accept open borders and free movement. And now he's saying, well, you know, perhaps, I mean, he did say outside, the immigration from outside the EU. Well, we can say immigration from outside the UK. I mean, well, no, because there is no, there is no reason to differentiate anymore. I mean, it's quite simple. You know, there was all, this is what a lot of people maybe, um, have been frustrated by there was always the capacity wasn't there to limit immigration outside the eu even when we were in the eu there was always that capacity but never taken up well th th there wasn't actually peter there was never any capacity to to limit it as such um, there was uh, with regard to skilled migration there was a, a, a twenty thousand seven hundred limit per year from outside the EU. I, I think that's perfectly feasible to have a limit on the number of people coming here to work, particularly in school jobs. And having a limit, I think, would encourage us to train, prepare our own people and workforce for, for the jobs that are needed. What there never has been is the number of people who could come to this country it for marriage, students. I mean, people say, oh, but students come and go. Well, a lot of them don't. Yeah. I mean, they, they arrive um, and they're here for three, four, five years longer, some of them. And they also, one particular home office study, the Migrant Journey um, study, found that uh, at one particular point, 20 percent of those who'd um, claimed to stay indefinitely were in fact um, uh, originally students. Mm -hmm. So uh, th th there, never, there never was any limit on the number of people who could come here to marry, to, um, to come here to study, to come here to come here for almost any reason about, except for particular work. Outside the EU, if you didn't have a work permit, you couldn't come here. You had to have a work permit. You would only be issued a work permit if there was a gap in, in our skills and if you were going to earn a certain level of money and if you had a certain qualification. Going back many years, the days when I was an immigration officer, in fact, there were no um, skill ceilings as such. You just had to be qualified in a particular area. We had, <coughs> we had a, a lot of um, people coming over here into the rag trade, for example, into um, the catering world. Um, so people would come very often, frankly, um, you would have a farmer, a peasant farmer from the middle of nowhere in the Middle East, in Turkey, in the Balkans, would turn up with a work permit to work in a sort of cordon bleu restaurant. And you knew that they were coming here, frankly, to lump things around and peel potatoes. But nevertheless, um, at the time, that was the constraint that you had to have certain qualifications and you had to have a work permit. We could do 
more, uh, frankly, to be selective about who comes here to work. Um, with those coming here to marry, well, um, we used to have uh, something that the Labour Party today did away with was the primary purpose rule so that um, you couldn't come here if your primary purpose for coming here was immigration. If that was the reason why you were marrying, then you were to be denied entry. Well, we did away with that. I can't see that um, any political party at the moment is going to say, I don't know, perhaps the SDP would, um, and, and some of the, the others, the offshoots of, um, of the UKIP and uh, Brexit parties, perhaps they would, but I can't see the Conservatives, um, the Labour Party, the Scottish National Party, the Lib Dems, they, I just cannot for, for one second think that they will introduce reintroduce something akin to the primary purpose rule. It just won't happen. Whether we should look more carefully at the age of, of those coming here to marry, uh, are they coming here simply to marry or uh, because they're looking for a bolt hole, they're, they're looking for a country to, to settle in? There is forced marriage, which has long been an issue. I, I, we shy away f from dealing with that. We pass all sorts of fancy laws and uh, legislation, but ultimately we know it still goes on. Oh, God, it's like FGM uh, as well. It's the same sort of thing. It still yeah, goes. It's been like one prosecution yeah. in 30 years. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, the good thing is that we don't regard that as, uh, as, as some sort of cultural practice that we should um, we should tolerate and no whatever practice it is and whichever part of the world it's being practiced then it's abhorrent and we should say no and to commit it is a criminal offense but all these different sort of pseudo religious uh, um, originated practices yeah certainly we should say no uh, you're not going to do that if you come here and and also be very careful about those who we do accept to come here to settle for all reasons really not just for marriage but uh, there are you know we, we keep throwing open the border to you know, five million Chinese Hong Kongers frankly um, we're saying oh yeah everyone that the uh, Taliban is now um, <laughs> dominating any one of you can can come here well no i'm sorry but that should not happen but that you know we, we could go on talking about this for mm. a long no, time no, peter I, absolutely it is it does seem sometimes like a self-destruction on on the part of the, the culture uh, sometimes you know um, but oh thank you very very much for uh, for joining us and um, be very interested to hear your comments on what we've been talking about. We've covered a hell of a lot of points there. So uh, thank you very much. Al. And um, well, that's it for So What You're Saying Is for this week. And uh, we'll be back next time. So thank you very much.